When a person becomes an open follower of Jesus, they speak for the Christian faith, whether they want to or not. At times, Christians say things that hurt the credibility of Christianity, and worse, the credibility of Jesus. It is true that sometimes Christians say stupid stuff that makes sense to no one. A lot of this is just cliché that has been said over the years and has become a part of the Christian jargon. In this series, we will present truth that makes sense, language that will clarify the incredible teachings of Jesus. We'd love to hear how Grace Church is affecting your life. Please send an email to info at gracesd.com with your story. Or if you'd like to help support our ministry financially, you can go to the website shown below to give so we can continue helping people find Christ and become his mature followers. so do I. A man said to me, pastor, that's the devil's music. I said, what's the devil's music? He said, that music you're playing in the church now. I said, what makes it the devil's music? He said, don't you know that guitars are Satan's instrument? I didn't want to tell him I played the guitar. He said, and the drums, those are from the pit of hell. Christians say stupid things. These drums back here, they are from hell, and that's why we have kind of a hedge, a hedge of protection so that the devil won't get out and get you. <laughs> so I said, well, let's look at Psalm 150, and I read just a few verses for him, and I said, it says, praise him with the trumpet. He goes, I like the trumpet. He says, praise him with the lute and the lyre. I said, even lyres can worship. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. He said, what? He's a Baptist. Baptists don't dance. I said, praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments. He goes, now that's praise, stringed instruments. I said, well, the guitar is a stringed instrument. He goes, that's not the right kind of stringed instrument. And the pipe. And then he got really upset when I read, praise him with the sounding cymbals. And if that's not bad enough, it says, praise him with loud, clashing cymbals. Ooh. <laughs> that definitely is the devil. You know, the quality of music um, spiritually has to do with two things, the lyrics and the attitude of the song. I don't think the instruments are, they're, they're spiritually neutral. And I don't think that God is up there going, you know, I can't handle the rock music. Uh, there's something wrong with that. You know, we say stupid things. I want to share with you a stupid thing that we say, and we hear it a lot in the church. So get ready. Hang on. Welcome to Grace Church. Glad to have you with us. And online campus, we're glad to have you with us. You joined us a little late. Glad you're here. Uh, if you need a Bible this morning, uh, raise your hand. Our ushers will hand you a Bible you can use. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you'll turn with me to that. Here's the stupid statement. Now, it sounds awesome. If you pray hard enough in faith, that's the caveat. If you pray hard enough in faith, you will be healed. Healing is contingent upon believing God. But if you really believe God, you will be healed. Sometimes false promises set people up for a destruction of their faith. Years ago in San Jose, I was pastoring a church and this one lady, I could see she was in a lot of physical pain. You could see it on her face. She was a middle-aged woman or a little older. And she had chronic back pain. She made her way to church. Some days she couldn't even walk. It was that bad. She had to be in a wheelchair. She had had three surgeries. And those surgeries didn't work. She went to the church, or the church she was going to at the time, and the pastor, in desperation, she went and said, can you pray for healing? And the pastor told her, I have good news. I have a word from the Lord. And the word from the Lord is that he is going to heal your body. And he began to pray for her, fervently prayed for her. And she wasn't healed. She said, 
I began to think that the church was fake and that I really couldn't trust the Lord. When I heard this, my heart sunk and I thought, what damage had taken place to this woman because this promise of healing didn't happen in her life. But if you pray hard enough in faith, you will be healed. Is that true? When we demand healing from God, we set God up for failure. Not God won't fail, but we set ourselves up for a perception that God has failed. This woman, Betty, um, her former pastor, she went to him and said, why haven't I been healed? And he said, we prayed for you, that for your healing. And so the problem is not God and it's not our prayer. The problem is you don't have enough faith. Here's the Here's what happened to Betty. Betty had lost connection to the church. Betty had lost connection to God. And now Betty had had to turn on herself. She had lost connection with herself. She is completely isolated in her suffering. And still, still she is not healed. What damage we do to people to make promises against God's power by telling them they're going to have something and then when it doesn't come, blaming, blaming them for that. So I thought I would take this issue and, and deal with it the best I can. An, another stupid thing that Christians say, God wants everyone healed. I checked this out because I've heard this many times. I've heard preachers, especially televangelists, say, God wants to heal everyone. God wants to heal your finances. God wants to heal your body. God doesn't want you to be sick. We bind the hand of Satan toward your sickness. I believe in a God who heals, but I don't believe in healing. There's a big difference. Because if I believe in healing and healing doesn't come, my faith is destroyed. But if I know that God truly is a God that can heal, but maybe sometime doesn't. So I thought I would go back and look at the ministry of Jesus and his healing ministry. And if you notice your outline, there's a couple of things I'll point out. Can't go through all of the things that he did in healing. He healed many people, but Jesus healed to prove he is the one with the Father, to prove that he was truly sent with the, from the Father and truly one with the Father. You notice there, John 10, 37 says, if I am not doing the works of my Father, I don't want you to believe in me. But if I do them, if I do the works of my Father, even though you don't believe in me, believe in the works that you may know and understand what? That the Father and I are one, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You see, Jesus had a purpose in healing people is that he would heal people to show that he was one with the Father. Those miracles prove that he was sent from God. The second thing that he did is that he wanted to heal people because of compassion. Uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 14, 14, he had arrived back from uh, on shore and he saw this large crowd that was waiting for them and he had compassion upon them, it says in John 14, 14. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. Apparently healed all of the sick in that situation. And his purpose was to show his compassion. But there's a couple of things, uh, two conclusions that I have as I've studied the healing ministry of, of Christ is Jesus healed many people. That's one thing. But the other thing is Jesus didn't heal most people. Most people that Jesus came in contact with, he didn't heal them. There were many people that were not healed in the ministry of Jesus. Why? Some people would say, well, wait a minute, if he has the power to heal, you know, I think of these faith healers that do this great demonstration in front of a large audience and do they draw a crowd? Why don't they just go to the hospital and heal everybody? What a ministry that would be. Just heal everybody. I, I, if, if I had that gift of healing and God used me to heal people that I laid hands on, I'd heal everybody. I'd like to heal my kids. I'm always laying hands on them. <laughs> But why did he leave most of the people unhealed? 
So before you start judging Christ, in fact, let me just give four questions to those who, people who judge Jesus. Number one, I would ask them, have you given all of the relief? Have you given your all to the relief of the suffering of those around you, the homeless? Have you given everything that you can? Second question is similar to that. Have you even given the surplus of what you have? Let's say you have finances to pay all your bills, your retirement, all everything that you need, and you have a surplus. Have you taken that money and those resources and used them to heal the hurting? Before you judge Jesus, maybe you ought to look in the mirror. Third question I have is, have you given anything for the suffering? These questions are convicting. And the fourth question is, have you promoted other people giving, saying that you're compassionate, when you have given nothing? I always find it amazing how politicians talk about their compassion and the way that works is they take money from other people and give it to the hurting. One of the great proponents of this, and I won't say his name because it would come off as partisan politics, but he was a sitting vice president in my lifetime, and there's been many because I'm old. <laughs> but one sitting vice president his taxes were released, and this is what his taxes said. He made $197,000, excuse me, $197,729. And his charitable donations were $353 for the year. But man, does he talk a good game of compassion. I'm thinking, man, that wouldn't feed my family for three days. I got too many kids. Isn't it interesting how we judge Jesus, we judge God, and yet what do we really do? So as we go through this, I want you to think about this, and at the end of the message, you'll hear from Pastor Jesse a challenge for you to get involved, how you can, with very little uh, effort on your part, you can do something. But here's four propositions on healing, talking about healing from God's perspective. Here are the four propositions. Proposition number one, God can and sometimes does heal. I believe in healing. Well, when I say I believe in healing, I believe that God can heal. I believe in the God that heals. When I was eight years old, I, my mother came out to the car. I was sitting in the car getting ready to go somewhere and she came out and I was in full convulsions. She rushed me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, when she got to the hospital with me, they immediately got, her in the emerg got me in the emergency room and they started doing tests and I went into a full coma of which I was in for two weeks. During that two weeks, the doctors had told my parents, your son has encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain. And your son, if he survives, is going to be a complete vegetable. He will not have any function of his brain. He will not have intellectual skill. He will not have communication skill. He will not even be able to control his bodily functions. Some of you are thinking, ah, it all makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad called the elders of the church. And my dad being the pastor, they came and they anointed me with oil and prayed for me. And several days later, I came out of the coma, and even though I had full amnesia, I was able to talk. I had full function of everything. You know, there were IQ tests that we took when I was a kid, back in the olden days. I won't say what year that was. But they gave us these IQ tests, and my IQ test, as a matter of school records, my IQ test showed a certain level of intelligence before I got sick, after I was healed, my IQ had gone up markedly. You think I'm a lousy pastor now. If I hadn't gotten sick, <laughs> I would be horrible. But God healed me. Do I believe in healing? Yes, I do. And I've seen people healed from horrible things, cancer, uh, back problems, all kinds of things. I believe that God heals. 
But God can and sometimes does heal. The second proposition is this. Uh, God can and sometimes does not heal. Why? Why does he not always heal? I believe in divine healing. Why doesn't God release that healing power? Proposition number three. Healing is not a right, but a gift. We can't demand of God something that would undermine his purpose in our life, which you'll see in a moment, because proposition number four is this. Sometimes healing does not fulfill the purpose of God in our lives. And I'll show you a scripture that's very clear about this, but I want to go back to this woman, Betty, who was severely in severe pain, and her situation was dire. She had found herself isolated from God, isolated from the church, isolated from herself, and unhealed. And I asked her, I said, Betty, would you be willing if God had another plan for your life other than physical healing? Would you be willing to wait until heaven to be healed? Because ultimately, all of us who are followers of Christ will ultimately be healed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Would you be willing to wait? And she said, I guess if I knew it was God's will. I said, we have prayed fervently that God would release you from this physical pain. But it appears he has said no. I told her I'm very sorry about what the church has done to you because the church has destroyed your faith. The church made a promise against God's power that he was not willing to do and you have found yourself isolated from God. You have found yourself isolated from the church and you found yourself self-loathing because you don't have enough faith because this pastor went to her and said, the reason you're not healed is because you don't have enough faith. Now it's her fault. And yet you still remain unhealed. And so my question to you, Betty, is where are you going to go for comfort and strength in the midst of your physical pain? Because you've shut off everyone, including your Lord. Over the next several months, our church began to pray for her and we stopped praying for her physical healing. We began to pray for the healing of her soul and the healing of her heart and God answered that prayer and we believed God for that healing and she began to have the presence of God that was so powerful that she was okay with the physical healing. And I gotta tell you, the good news is she had the presence of God. The bad news is she never got phys physical healing all the way until her death. But the moment she was absent from this body, she was present with the Lord and no more pain, no more suffering. But in that midst of that, she had found the beauty of the presence of God in the midst of her suffering. We live in a day where everything is fast food. I'll tell you what, when I go to a drive through and you know I can't stand those squawk boxes, I can't even understand them, but they're talking to me and I'm like, yes, do, do I want a what? Super what? Uh, super size, super, uh, yeah, no, I don't want a super size. And then I get up there and then, you know, because we have special order, you know, because we're paleo, they say, would you mind moving out of the way for the rest of the people and parking over there? And I'm like, this is a fast food place. I don't want to park. I want my food now. If I get sick, give me a pill. If I have a broken bone, Give me surgery. I want a quick fix, you know. We are desperate for gratification. We are desperate for the relief of pain. And I understand that that human condition is very difficult. But sometimes healing doesn't fulfill the purpose of God in our lives. And let me show you what I mean. 2 Corinthians 12, I asked you to turn there. Paul writes this, so to keep me from becoming conceited. Becoming so self-absorbed and so puffed up in my own eyes because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. He had just shared the revelation. He had actually been transported in a vision into the presence of God. He had gone to the very throne room of God and he saw in this vision, he saw what God's heaven actually looks like. And he said, there are things that I saw, I'm not even allowed to talk about them. Of course, today we write books, you know, four minutes in heaven, you know, whatever it is. But he said, I can't even talk about it. But he said it was glorious. 
And God gave me this vision. And this vision gave me a special insight to God. And I realized I could become very conceited with that. So a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. God allowed Satan to inflict my body, my flesh, to keep me from becoming conceited. Say, Lord, I'll humble myself. Just fix me, you know? I don't know how many times I've gotten sick and I go bargain with God. Lord, look, I'm going to start giving more than I'm giving now. Just make this go away. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. It doesn't matter. It was some physical ailment. And I'm glad he doesn't tell us what it is because then we can apply it in our lives wherever it is. But notice the next verse. Verse 8 says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. If I'm sick, three times, it doesn't even scratch the surface of how many times I call, to call upon the Lord. Lord, come on. Three times. I don't know whether it meant three prayers or three seasons of prayer. It doesn't matter. But notice Paul was accepting the thorn in his flesh after three seasons of prayer or three prayers. After pleading with God, he realized God wasn't going to heal him. And he accepted that. You know, at some point for Betty, she had to come to realize God has chosen not to heal her body. And there's got to be a different path. Paul said in verse 9, but he said to me, this is what God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, listen to this, my power is made perfect in weakness. So when you are weak, that's when I have the ability. You're cast upon me, and I can make you strong. I can make you powerful. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, of whatever this thorn in the flesh is, whatever this physical ailment was. I will glory in that so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is God's power. This is an infusion of power. I see three things here. Number one, Paul made a fundamental choice to embrace weakness, to embrace physical suffering as an asset, not a liability. He actually saw his physical ailment as some kind of a benefit to him, not as a liability. We always see physical suffering or financial problems or marital problems or problems with our knucklehead kids. You know, we see these things as a liability, not an asset. And Paul tells us that he will glory in the suffering. The second thing I notice in this is that there is no sense of entitlement on Paul's part. Just a simple heart of submission. All right, God, you're not going to take it away. I'm okay with that. Because the third thing is that this is an opportunity for the supernatural power of God to rest on the soul of Paul. He made a fundamental choice. He wasn't entitled. And he saw the goal was so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Are you able to go that route? Are you still upset with God that he hasn't healed you? It's a miraculous thing when we suffer and God heals. But here you are in your suffering. And I want you to see Betty in this circle. She's suffering. She's isolated from everyone. She hates herself because she doesn't have enough faith. She hates the church because the church is judging her. She hates God because God won't heal her. She's still suffering. So what do we do with this suffering? Where do we go with it? So we have a couple of choices. One choice is to expect healing. I will not stop till you heal me, God. And we demand it, that healing. And we won't stop in our quest until God finally heals. You can go that route. But there's another choice, and that is an expectation of intimacy with God. And when we submit, God gives us strength. You have a choice. Betty had a choice. And Betty found the greater and lived with the lesser. Can you do that? Had someone come up to me after we, several weeks ago, sang that song that we just sang this morning and said, what does it mean, deep cries out to deep? What is that? You know, you're listening to that song and go, that's the problem with music today. It doesn't make sense. Well, that actually happens to come right out of Scripture. Psalm 42, deep cries out to deep. What does that mean? That's verse 7 of Psalm 42. Psalm 42 verse 1 says this. 
As the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul pants after you. And yet my suffering is before me day after day. It seems like it won't go away. But God, I pant after you. I long for you. But my suffering won't stop. Deep after deep, waterfall crushing over me. The waves are destroying me. It won't go away. But my heart pants after you. That's the whole point of the psalm. That the pursuit of the greatest value in life is intimacy with God. Submit to that and God gives you strength in the midst of your suffering. Oh, that doesn't work in 2015 because we want to fix. That's not life. We live in a fallen world. We suffer because of sin. We suffer because we're sinners, but God is good. And ultimately, he will heal all of you who are followers of Christ. All of you. He says in verse 10, for the sake of Christ... That's pretty powerful. For the sake of Christ, not for my sake, because it was up to me, Paul is saying, I would love to be healed. I would love to see Betty healed. I would love to see all of you healed. And there are people trying to heal you all the time. Long after you've accepted it, Johnny Erickson Tata, perfect example. Anybody know who she is? Quadriplegic, in a wheelchair her whole life. And she said this. She said, I would rather this suffering, I wouldn't give up this suffering for anything because of the intimacy I've had with God. That's a mature response. We're not all Johnny. So how do we process this? For the sake of Christ, there is something greater than my life. I am content. I am satisfied with the weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities far beyond just the human suffering. People hate me. People want to kill me, Paul says. I am persecuted. I am inflicted. I am attacked. I am falsely identified as someone who is an enemy of Christ. And all of these things, for the sake of Christ, I'm satisfied. It's okay. I'm not a martyr. I am doing this for the sake of Christ. For when, and this is the conclusion, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I've shared this before, but aging is tough. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you can take you about four or five minutes to get out of that chair. Some of you, you know, you saw that soft chair and you see young people sitting in it and you go, wait a minute. No, I know how that works. My kids, I used to chase them around when they were little and they go, come on, old man, try to catch up. And they're right, I'm a lot older than them. Aging is tough. But my mother, in her 80s, I saw the effects of aging in her life. She got macular degeneration. And with that macular degeneration, her blindness began to just crowd in on her eyes. And all she could see for several years was shadows. And then that that began to dim. And as she was approaching 90 she started having what is called CBS, Charles Bonnet syndrome. Charles Bonnet was a a physician who observed in the lives of older people that had gone blind because of oldness, whether it's macular degeneration or whatever, and they cataracts and so forth. And he saw that approximately around mid-60s, when someone goes blind, that their brain is so used to seeing that when they can't see physically with their eyes, their brain makes up images he called hallucinations. And those hallucinations are a mechanism of the brain making up some things that are not there. And my mother got Charles Bonnet syndrome, and she started having hallucinations. At first, they scared her to death. She told me after a while, she goes, kind of nice to have some company. (laughs) But then the hallucinations combined with mild dementia started going south on her. And she started having, because of her mental state, her physical brain was struggling with the hallucinations she was seeing. And 
she called me one day and I was sitting in a coffee shop and she said, son, I'm sitting in my bed and I need to go to the bathroom and I'm afraid to get out of my bed. And I said, mom, it's okay. And she said, I'm looking over the side of my bed and there's a cliff. And I said, mom, listen, you got to trust your brain, not your eyes. You got to know what is true. You are in your bedroom. Feel that bed. You know, feel that pillow. Know where you are. And she said, I know I'm in my bedroom, but I'm looking at it. It's as vivid as could be. And I said, Mom, it's a, it's a hallucination. It's not real. She never had any sound. If you start having sound with your vision, you got a little problem. But anyway, she just had this vision. And I said, Mom, I want you to get on the side of your bed. And I want you to just put your feet down and just trust me. Trust your son. And put your feet down. And she did. And she said, there's solid ground. And I said, she said, I can't see my way to the bathroom. Her tiny little apartment was one bedroom and a bathroom. And I said, Mom, just walk three steps forward. I knew her apartment very well. And I said, put your hand out and touch that wall. And she walked over and touched the wall. And she said, what do I do now? And I said, walk to the corner of that wall. Walk to your right until you get to the corner. And you feel that corner? She said, I feel the corner. I said, all right, turn that corner and go down to, you feel that door. I said, you feel that door? And she said, yeah. And I said, mom, turn into the bathroom. And I had to help her through the process of going to the bathroom. My sweet mother, I'm just like, God, heal her. Can't you stop this? Come on, God. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, what do you want from God? She said, the healing isn't coming, so all I want is for God to be present in my fear. And he was. I don't think we understand the purpose of suffering. The cause of it is sin, but the purpose of it is that the power of God might rest upon our lives. Oh, I know we want healing. We want to see change, but... We want it so bad, we will take scriptures and we'll make statements like this. By his stripes, we are healed physically. And we quote Isaiah and we say, that's what it says. That's not what it says. It says, by his stripes, we will be healed. Look what it says. It says in Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. That means we violated a law. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sin. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment of that sin, and that he brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. King James says, by his stripes, we are healed. By his beating, we are healed. And people just insert right here, physically. He's not talking about physical healing. Look at the context. Transgressions, violation of a law, iniquity, sin, punishment of that sin. That's what he's healing. He's healing us spiritually. Look at the next verse. He says this. All we like sheep have gone astray. Turn to somebody and say, you're a sheep and you've gone astray. No, you don't want to do that. It's the wrong church. (laughs) I hate it when pastors do that. Turn to somebody and say, God loves you. Like, no, I'm here to observe. I don't want to play. (laughs) All we like sheep have gone astray. We have abandoned God. We have turned everyone to his own way. And I love this. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. Are you understanding what he's saying? He's saying this, that in fact... Your healing is a spiritual healing that God has given to you the capacity to have soul healing, to have spiritual healing, and ultimately physical healing. And even if God heals you today, I have some bad news. You're still going to die. I've looked at the statistics. The statistics are staggering. One out of one people die. That's you. (laughs) But God wants to touch your soul. 
God wants to touch your spirit. He wants to bring life to your spirit. He wants to give you eternal life. And I can tell you right now, if you will simply turn to Jesus Christ, you will have that eternal life. You simply come to him and say, Lord, I get it. I hear it. That my judgment was put on you. That my sin was put on you. That my violations of the law, my transgressions were put on you. That you died for my sin. Would you bow your head? Just as I close this message, I want to challenge you. Don't any longer wait to come to Christ. Christ wants to take you and transform your life. He wants to give you eternal life. You simply need to come to him and say, God, I don't just want benefits in time, in this lifetime. I want to have eternity with you And for God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus that if you'll simply believe in him, you will never perish but have everlasting life. You will have soul healing. You will have spiritual healing. You will be set free for eternity if you'll simply come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I accept your gift of forgiveness through our sins being placed in your body, Jesus. And so I receive you as my savior. And he will come into your life and he will heal your soul. He will heal your spirit and he will set you alive. And you will have an eternity with Christ. Heavenly Father, for each person here, for those who are broken in body, for those who need physical healing, we pray by the power of the resurrection, Father, that you would touch their body, that you would heal them. And yet, Lord, if you choose not to, I pray, Father, that you would give them soul healing, that they might pursue you, that as the deer pants after the water brook, that each person here would seek after you with that tenacity, with a thirst for you, God, may we never stop for the greater value and that is intimacy with you and for anyone who doesn't know Jesus may this be the day of salvation we pray this in Jesus name amen